international markets. So international is a, a big thing uh, that we do at JP Morgan. We operate in 60 countries where we can provide uh, in-country banking support to our clients. But I'm here tonight as chairman of our International Advisory Council, which I'm really excited about. When the council started, the, uh, the whole reason for our existence is to get the word out about Cobb County uh, to the world. Uh, that, I would say, is half of our goal, is to help companies find Cobb County, come here, build a headquarters building, the manufacturing facility. But equally important is helping uh, Cobb County businesses learn about exporting and the value of, of looking at foreign markets, international markets. Uh, the thing I love about these type of events is the stories. There's always so many great stories, some really positive, some really scary, um, and hopefully we'll get a little combo, combination of both tonight. And I was speaking with Jennifer here, um, who shared with me that her company was one of the first recipients of the export awards uh, that J.P. Morgan sponsored uh, some years ago. And her business gone from no exports to, what, you said 25% of sales, 20-ish? So that's a, a real success story. Um, so uh, got an interesting program tonight. I want to thank our sponsors and speakers from the Manili Farm, Vistra, Sweetwater. Where's the Sweetwater at? He's not here, but not here. we got the beer. That's OK, we got the beer. <laughs> I highly recommend the lager. It goes down easy. Uh, and of course, uh, Trevor here with Global Atlanta, who's a very important partner to what we're trying to achieve with the International Council. So uh, again, thank you for coming tonight. Very glad to see a great turnout with a, a very important topic. Hopefully you learn a lot tonight. Um, I think the more you connect with people in the room, the more you learn and the more help you'll find when you need it. So at this point, let me invite Margaret from the Manili firm to come up. Oh, come on up. One more okay. comment I want to make uh, is last, gosh, it was last week. <laughs> Amanda and I attended the Georgia Economic Development Department's International Representative Reception. They haven't done this you know, since pre-COVID, where they bring in all the international representatives from Georgia's offices across the world. Um, so we had people from, from Korea, from Brussels, from Tokyo, and we were able to interact with all of them. And the thing that was very rewarding to me is I made contact with Pat Wilson, who runs that whole department. Pat and I are friends from a long, long ways back. And he said, hey, because I've heard we talk to in Cobb. It's really great. And so the more people I've talked to, the more people who realize that Cobb is raising its game on the international front. And I think we can count on those partners to help us as your companies need to go overseas as a and as we want to attract foreign businesses to this community. So just wanted to share that report from the International Committee. Margaret? Hi, thank you. Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Margaret Ryan. I'm the marketing director with the Manili Farm PC. We are all family law, all around Georgia, all around the world. You get me this evening because all of our attorneys are down in Savannah doing a series of training. So I'm excited to be here with you guys tonight. Uh, our home office is here in Cobb County. We've got six offices throughout the state of Georgia. We are looking to grow internationally as soon as next year. Um, but again, we practice domestic and international family law as well as estate planning and probate. So to be very eloquent, I'm going to read to you one of my favorite statements that I think sums us up best. Founding partner Michael Manili is recognized all around Georgia and all around the world as a leader in domestic and international family law. The Manili firm has assembled an unparalleled network of international, legal, and diplomatic professionals across every continent, except Antarctica, uh, with whom the firm collaborates to resolve multinational family law disputes. Reflecting the diverse world community we serve, the Manili firm has built a caring, accomplished, multicultural and multinational team of legal professionals. Through the work we do, we are honored to encourage and support our clients to realize their hopes, dreams, and aspirations. So that is what we do on a domestic and international scale, and we're grateful you are here tonight. Thank you.
So I'd like Trevor up to uh, lead our panel with discussion on export. Great. I have a microphone. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. I had it turned on and everything. So. Awesome. I'm going to actually ask Gonzalo Garcia to come up and uh, one of our sponsors tonight from Vistra, or you can just stay there and introduce yourself, I just so you know who he is. He's the one providing, uh, help us provide the food and some of the drinks tonight. No, I'm uh, happy to be here. I'm actually in Florida Bay, but I visit every month. Uh, Vistra, we're a global uh, international supply chain So what we do is that we help companies that are going to countries either to set up a business or to run or and or to run all the back office for accounting inside the same volume of plans. And we also have an advisory app. So we work with law firms, we work, we work with accounting firms, or we provide a full service depending on, on the what the client wants. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we did a great event with, with Vistra not too long ago, so we're grateful to continue the relationship. Um, why do we, why is Global, what is Global Atlanta, and why do we care so much about exports? Uh, so Global Atlanta is a new service here in Atlanta covering international business, uh, education, trade, culture, really looking at how Atlanta is connected with the rest of the world. And so uh, we've noticed in the course of our 30 years uh, as a publication, that not that many uh, publications focus on trade unless it becomes a problem, right? It's always about um, loss of jobs to trade, new trade agreements that end up you know, hurting communities, et cetera. No one has really talked too much uh, about the opportunities of trade, right? And we, of course, we don't want to be polyamish. We don't want to act like trade, uh, trade agreements haven't hurt folks uh, in certain cases or that uh, global dislocations in the global economy that haven't hurt anybody. But at the same time, uh, our whole posture as a publication is that if you look at, um, if you are intentional about looking at these connections that Atlanta has around the world, you can, you can create opportunities. You can be part of, uh, part of the, the growth story of the city. And so we've got three great companies tonight that really exemplify that. Um, there's really been, uh, it was mentioned that uh, JP Morgan started the, the export challenge. There's really been the, the growth of uh, the export ecosystem, I would say, here in, in Georgia. Um, steadily over the last many years. Uh, we in 2014 were honored to win the E Award for Export Service uh, for the information that we provide from the Commerce Department. But what's cool about that, and I'll just to toot our own horn, we were part of a group of Georgia organizations that was that went up to DC and basically took over the entire state. <laughs> there was no other uh, state that had such a, a strong representation here. So there's a really strong export ecosystem here. Um, you know, the state of Georgia, the Metro Atlanta Chamber, the Cobb Chamber. I've been a judge on the uh, Atlanta Metro Export Challenge, um, so been evaluating some of these applications. This has been one of the most fun parts of my job, learning about what companies do. Um, you know, I'm, I'm on the board of the Georgia District Export Council, of which we have some representatives here, um, which is really a, a group of uh, private sector individuals helping uh, advise companies on exports. And so there's, there's really a lot of resources and what I find, what all of these organizations will tell you is that people don't know how to connect with those resources and with the right people uh, to get their problems solved. And so we need events like this to, to start uh, doing that. So we started this Export Stories, uh, I guess you could call it a brand at this point, probably not, um, about five or six years ago. And we were doing it on a more statewide basis where we were looking at um, the export operations of various companies around the state, doing profiles, releasing a report, and doing an event around that. And uh, we decided, why not take it on the road? And uh, th this is the first one we've done since the pandemic, and we decided to focus it in on Cobb County. So, um, and that's part of our partnership with Cobb. So, I'm going to bring up our panelists, and we'll get our conversation going. So, we've got Claudia Membrano, uh, Vice President of Risk Management and Operations at Intero International. We've got A.J. Bentel, uh, president of Valtork International, a uh, company that was started by his father 40 years ago, so we'll learn about the history there. And we've got Roger Richardson, the CEO and founder of Delta Sigma Company, a provider of custom machine vision robotic solutions, mixed reality products, and leading systems used for RCS, antenna, and material measurements. I'm going to let him translate that for you. Um, but uh, yeah, let's to get started, I guess. Yeah, and we'll just pass the mic around. We've got the one mic. So, um, to get started, I guess, Claudia, why don't you tell us a bit, a bit about Intera International and what y'all do, and we'll kind of go down the line. All of you obviously are based here in Cobb County, but uh, tell us a bit about your company. 
Uh, so Inter International is a international food and distribution company. We focus on food commodities, uh, from meat products to dry products. Uh, we have uh, businesses in about 114 countries we export, and we buy from about 45 countries. We have offices here in Atlanta, Shanghai, China, Monterey, Mexico, and Paris, France, as well as people located in strategic uh, countries around the world. And I would ask if y'all could add one thing to your spiel at the beginning. What percentage of your sales, if you can say, are exports? I would say at this point, probably 95%. Okay, so that, that'll, it'll show you the gradation here. I think it'll be interesting. Yeah, I'm a long ways off of that. <laughs> so. But his business is a lot sexier than mine. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we probably range 10 to 20%, uh, de you know, depending on the year. Mm -hmm. uh, we do project-based things, so it's, it's very up and down, so it, it can fall um, different ways from year to year. Yeah. Uh, so we do a lot of um, stealth technology, R&D related things. Most of that is domestic, although right now we do have a system that we're about to send to uh, Taiwan to help them uh, do those kind, same kinds of things. We do a lot of uh, assembly lines for aircraft, trucks, you know, things that are big. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really where we specialize. So you're helping design the production line, or you're helping do use? So we would design. Yeah, we would design some part of the production okay. line. So with with big things like uh, trucks or airplanes, there'll be you know a lot of cells with different expertise. Somebody's mm -hmm. making the wings, the fuselage, yeah. you know, various parts of it. So we do all of the parts, but only uh, we have three airplanes where we do all of the parts. Mm -hmm. We're on. Uh, 45 different aircraft right now in 15 countries mm. on five continents. Um, you know, with with various, but it varies a lot. It's not a product. It's yeah. just a, what yeah. problem needs to be solved. And you've introduced the mixed reality component to help standardize processes and make uh, reduce errors, I guess, on the line. Correct. So uh, we we patented an augmented reality system. So you could kind of the simple way to describe it is. If on the table here, you've got a, you know, some soda cans and water bottles, and they're supposed to go in exactly that place. No one's laying on the table. It goes exactly right there. Uh, if you think about how things are built, there would normally be some drawings or some kind of documentation that says, put this soda can here, put this phone here. You know. But with our augmented reality system, you just see it there. It just looks like that. And so now you just, now these would be with aircraft parts or truck parts. You just see where they go. It doesn't need words. It doesn't need any further explanation. Somebody with a little bit of training just knows what to do. Yeah, awesome. We have about close, we're getting close to 500 of those systems now. Mm. How many employees total? 21. Okay, nice. Great, AJ. Hey, How are you guys doing? Yeah. <laughs> Right. Uh, Valtorque uh, International is a U.S. manufacturing facility for valves, valve automation equipment. Um, we sell industrial control products uh, worldwide <coughs> through distribution, uh, end users, OEMs. Um, we've been in business for 40 years, and we sell right now to about about 60% of our business is actually 40% is um, uh, international. Building that up. Yeah, great. We'll come back to that. You can tell us all about valves. I'm excited. Um, so, I know that at least I'm not sure if valves work, but I know that Intera and Delta Sigma have, have both gotten recognition from either, say, the state of Georgia through the Globe Award or the, the Atlanta Metro Export Challenge, of which Select Cobb is one of the main partners, uh, or uh, the uh, Commerce Department. So, what do those kinds of recognition uh, uh, Notices of recognition kind of do for you as a company when you're uh, when you're trying to build your exports. Yeah. Yeah, we've we've uh, actually won the, uh, the global award the global for the award. last yeah. for the last three years. So uh, we you know we've been building up and exporting quite a bit. Uh, we started as a just a Georgia company, and then built it up into the U.S. market, and then took it internationally and. Um, we're, and we're doing a lot with the military, um, Department of Defense, DOD, um, U.S. Army, Air Force, Naval Warfare, and so 
Our equipment is used on ships, planes, uh, all over all over the world. And nuclear plants, power plants, pharmaceutical, food processing, and chemical plants. A lot of good diversification there. <laughs> So we, uh, we won the Export Achievement Award a couple of years ago from Commerce. Mm -hmm. And so in our, uh, when you're asking somebody to, you know, let me build part of your airplane, it's not a thing that those guys would take lightly. So they want to, they want to have good reasons to believe that they would, they can be confident that if I turn this over to you, it's not going to turn out bad. Um, and, and so that's one of the things of, uh, on our page of reasons why you should trust us. You know, our Export Achievement Award is included on that page. And, I, and it's all things that I think just gives people, you got experience with exporting, you know, I got, I got a reason to believe you're going to come a long way to be able to help us. What about you, Claudia? So for Intera, I think it's validation of the work that we have done over the last 20 plus years as Intera and over 40 years with the founders of the company. Uh, we started with Puerto Rico as our export market <laughs> and then now we're 114 countries. And I think for us it's about the people because we don't make anything uh, like the other two companies. We connect the world through food and we liaison with vendors and customers all over the world. So for them to know our presence, our strength, but more importantly for our people to know that the company that they work for really focuses on this mission and diversity is one of our core strengths. I think it's validation of that work and that commitment. Yeah, I was gonna ask you that, like how do you staff up for an export oriented operation in a different way than you would just building a domestically oriented shop? So obviously we are how, very- I guess how did y'all manage that transition into yeah. that way? Yeah. yeah, so for us, it started with, that was always the goal. So it was, uh, and the founder of the company always focused on three steps ahead, not just what's in front of us. So that was always the mission, and it's about the behavior. So we always recruit by the values, first and foremost, then by the attitude and the character of the person, and we build on that. Having diversity really makes us strong because we have that cultural affinity with our customers and vendors. Uh, we speak the language in trade, but also the actual language, so we have about 34 nationalities and 17 languages spoken in the office, so that wow. truly helped us have a bigger reach and a deeper reach with customers. That's awesome. Yeah, how do you find those people that speak all those languages? <laughs> yeah, I bet you'll get swamped with inquiries after this because I, I feel like that's the big challenge for a lot of companies, particularly when you add on an engineering layer or something on top of that, it's really a challenge for people to find those people. Yeah, so we have an amazing HR department that really works very hard at recruiting high quality uh, individuals. And then we do a lot of referrals. So internal employees bring other employees. Mm -hmm. And again, that's, that's a great way to ensure that what you're bringing in is gonna hold the culture of the company. That's mm -hmm. huge for us. Uh, we're right now at about 149 employees, but we still operate as a family company where again, values are at the core of what we do. So then I think, you know, having that, that relationship built, that very um, direct north, which is what guides us, is important. Uh, the recruiting through other employees, which again, have already some of that diversity and nationality. And basically, we're always looking, always looking. And even if we don't have a position, if you're good people, we'll bring you in and then we'll figure it out. I like it. <laughs> That's smart. I like that idea too. Yeah. I do the same thing. Roger, did you want to comment on that? I had another question for you, but go ahead. Um, you know, just if you're twenty, if it's twenty percent of your sales, right? It's obviously a nice chunk, but it's not everything you do, right? Exporting. So, how do you intentionally focus on that as a part of your business while not getting distracted from your core business in, here in the U.S.? Like, how do you how do you well, avoid missing different. out on opportunities? They're, they're it's the same thing. Okay. So, if you think about, so primarily we're aerospace, mm -hmm. not exclusively, but certainly 90% of our business is aerospace. Well, how many airplanes, how many people make airplanes? Right. It's a small number. Yeah. So the so the total potential customers, now there is more of those customers out of the United States. Roger, can you hold the mic closer to your Sorry. Yeah. There's, there's more aerospace manufacturers outside the United States than inside, but um, but still, it's a it's a fairly small number. It's not difficult to talk to all of them. AJ, what about you? You said that's been intentional. Um, it's been intentional on your on your part to grow nationally and then internationally. How did how have y'all achieved that? 
Uh, we've done a lot with uh, the internet, so we do a lot of, we own a lot of websites um, that we, that actually spider a lot of the information all over the, the world, so um, we get a lot of distribution from different countries. Um, I'm not sure how it works, but they, they contact us. I, just, <laughs> just, uh, I don't know, we get, we get calls from every country, literally, I mean, every day from a new country. Yeah. And it's, I really have no idea how it's coming. Now, did y'all do a lot of work to like internationalize your website or make we it did, available yeah. in different languages and such? Uh, we didn't do that, but we, uh, you know, we um, just built it out to where you know, we work with a lot of different countries. I, I don't, honestly have no idea how it's, how it's happening. I just, it's just coming. So when it, does, when it does happen, like how do you capitalize on it, right? Like more, I, I mean, I try to sell them everything I can. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I get quotes from everywhere. Uh, Zambia, uh, Nigeria, uh, I mean, Malaysia. I mean, every country there possibly is, you know. Yeah. Do you attribute that to like the made in the USA cachet? Or it, like, I think I mean, so. You know, so since we're a U.S. manufacturing facility, it's a lot of comp a lot of people around the world they want U.S. products, and since we push that really hard, um, I think that's the reason for a lot of companies coming to us um, that want U.S. made products. And, and that's huge. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's uh, for for us it's very important. So when they Don't make, make everything, but do a lot of fabrication and uh, machining and you know in our facility and all that so yeah you know. so when they do make the order I guess I'm losing my microphone here so when they do make the order how do you deliver it in a such a way that you're not taking on a ton of risk like how do you manage uh, we, payment well, risk they have to pay up front yeah. <laughs> yeah. no risk at all I mean we should because we'd probably get a lot more business but um, you know, um, we're doing a lot in Saudi Arabia right now, and most of those, you know, terms are usually uh, like 20% down and then balance prior to shipment. So that's how we manage a lot of our shipments and our orders, and a lot of com countries don't like that. They, yeah. they, they want Inca terms and all this stuff and a letter of credit. I'm not doing it. It's seriously, <laughs> you know, I'm just not, we don't want to take the risk. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, I know yeah. there's other ways to do it, mm -hmm. uh, we just haven't done it. I want to hear the other ways to do it. Have y'all done differently? And I'm getting the power box now, so uh, <laughs> hopefully I won't fade out anymore. So we we do Eagle terms, and and normally we're, we'll be paid usually 90% by shipping, so there's mm -hmm. milestones along the way yeah. as we're developing a system for some way. Uh, they make the payment that would get them to 90% and then once it's up and running we wouldn't be losing money at, right. at the 10 you know if we didn't get paid the 10% but we the, but the worst that's ever happened for us is we had a company in Indonesia who converted you know from their currency to ours but then the bank didn't send the money for about five days and the exchange rate had gone against us by about $700 oh so it is a Seven hundred thousand dollar order, and we lost seven hundred dollars. So yeah, that's bad. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, 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 right. It wasn't, and that's the worst that's ever happened. Yeah. So well, that's good. You know. So I we, that, at least with our customers, we we don't we're dealing with billion dollar companies. Right. So we don't really have a problem. They got pretty well ordered. Mm -hmm. The airline, or not the airlines, but the uh, aircraft manufacturers certainly do not want to have a reputation of, right. of not paying. Have so you worked with Exim Bank, Export Import Bank, or any other uh, so far we credit have agencies like that? Okay. I tried to, but it's um, it's just a lot of red tape. Yeah. It's, it's kind of hard to, yeah. to get that going. That's interesting. Yeah. Because you know the Export Import Bank will give financing to your customer on you know, any other There's country. There's a lot of costs involved to, yeah. to use them. Yeah. Claudia, well, yeah, you're you're got de-risking in your title, so yeah, so you. <laughs> everything is great. Uh, so basically, we do it all. We do all kinds of income terms, all kinds of payment terms, from the most secure to the most risky. We have a very well-rounded, proactive process, which we call it a 360 approach. Basically, we look at everything 
uh, that we can get our hands on before approving a customer, and obviously depending on the risk of the terms is the further vetting that we do. Um, so that minimizes a lot of the issues uh, down the line, but we have to uh, model our strategy to be competitive in the industry and in the market. So we wouldn't offer open terms in Benin, Africa, but we wouldn't offer, uh, offer LC in Mexico because that's not what's competitive in the market. So we have to adhere to that and we do, that do a lot of preparation to avoid issues, be proactive. Uh, also, we always look at the customer at the end because we do have some customers in Africa that have open terms, just like we have some customers in Mexico that are 100% prepayment. So it is always the market strategy and then the customer worthiness and then a very uh, deep and proactive approach to making sure that we are doing business with the right accounts. And I do have a few good stories, but somebody's gonna have to buy me a drink. To <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what, what about uh, in terms of currency risk? I mean, you, do you trade mostly just in US dollars? Because I know that sometimes if you offer terms in, in the local currency, you can uh, get better. Uh, yeah, so for the most part, it is U.S. dollars. We do trade in euros for a lot of our customers in Africa that are uh, able to get that currency and some Mexican pesos because we have a company in Mexico. But for the most part, we still do U.S. dollars or a hard currency that is easy to trade. And we hedge for the most part. Yeah, great. Okay. So, uh, Roger, so you're, are you exporting a service along with the equipment? Itself, like when, you, particularly when you're talking about the augmented reality, I'm imagining that they have some kind of ongoing relationship with you to be able to maintain that. And most of that's going to be by phone. Okay. So pretty often we will send somebody over to do the initial setup, go through mm -hmm. a training process. It's a different way of thinking about work instructions mm -hmm. uh, when you're doing it with augmented reality. So, uh, but usually after three days, they're good to go. Okay. And, Periodically, somebody would call. I'm trying to import this kind of data, you know, from this particular CAD package, and I'm getting a funny answer. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. How do you handle that, AJ, with um, service? I mean, if something happens with one of your your valves that's installed in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. What? How do you? Um, it's you it's you know very difficult. I mean, we'll we'll have it shipped back, or um, we we don't send people out there. Mm. It's, it, you know, once you send it overseas, it's uh, pretty much they get, they bought it. And if it breaks down, they'll buy new ones. So, yeah, you like to sell more. That's <laughs> my motto. Sell as much as possible. Yeah. I love it. You know, it breaks. So, <laughs> planned obsolescence. Yeah. Just no, like a smart I, I don't want it to break. Right. I mean, we sell like really high end equipment. Yeah, and so, but, um, it, you know, uh, we've had our, our issues uh, with with things uh, breaking. And also, it's like if it's shipping. not installed correctly, I'm assuming. That yeah, it it's uh, you know it's some highly technical products that um, you know they burn out or they um, install it incorrectly or disassemble it, and it's you know um, and also like in shipping. I mean, we send a lot of containers all over the world, and uh, you know some of the stuff either air freight or in the containers, you know, you don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Water damage, um, it could be a number of things. Yeah. So it's very difficult yeah. uh, once it ships overseas. Mm -hmm. So in light of all that, do you feel like exporting has made your company more resilient or more profitable? No, I think it's great, yeah, I, I love it. I mean, the more countries, the better. Yeah. Uh, it's just, um, you know, I like to see where it goes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't know where it goes. Uh, yeah. I found one of my distributors in Saudi Arabia, and the valves are going to Mecca, and I was I was shocked mm -hmm. uh, that um, we have a ton of valves in in a very holy site there. So very happy with that. Yeah. What about you, Roger? Do you, do you think since you started on this journey, has this kind of become more of a strategy for the company versus something that you're reacting to? Well, certainly. We, we will continue to grow our international business. Mm -hmm. In our business, you know, I know all of our customers. So yeah. it's, a, it's, it's more of a relationship. Right. And so traveling to all these places, meeting them, seeing how they do things culturally, yeah. they build, you know, they, they just do things completely different. And a lot of times there's a, 
you know, if, if you've never been, if you've never spent a lot of time overseas, mm -hmm. particularly working with people like yeah. that, um, you just, like we all have, I think me anyway, I assume probably most people, there's right and there's not right. But then you go, like, oh no, there's a lot of right. <laughs> yeah. So, right, right. To, to, to bring that back to our culture, mm -hmm. I think it's been really helpful to us. So, you know, just continuing to do it, I certainly will. Yeah, I think a lot of people that I've talked to in the export world talk about how and you get innovation through cross border interaction, right? Like, uh, For sure. And it goes to probably this point about diversity, right? right. Uh, different modes of thought, different ways to do things, creates innovation. Um, Probably it's been a very rocky past few years, particularly when it comes to the logistics. So um, I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit, just how things may have changed in the last, since the pandemic particularly. Um, I know that trucking has been really challenging. There's driver shortages, et cetera. So how are you all managing with all that? Particularly if you don't control your whole supply chain, how can you de-risk again? So I'll take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I one of the things- So we can get the good story. <laughs> There's good stories here. Uh, okay. uh, so basically, it's preparation, because again, there was a lot of things that we couldn't control directly. So then mm -hmm. having those relationships with our vendors, service, product, customers, that really helps. Uh, the team really, really pivoted very quickly. We have specialists in every area that they have those relationships. They can pick up the phone. They can troubleshoot issues. So it got very complicated in about five different po points of the supply chain. So then being able to reassess, change, communicate, collaborate uh, is a team sport for us. So then the more people that are involved in a solution, the better the outcome. It was very difficult. We were having to rework loads maybe five times, you know, to get them to where they needed to go. And even with that, there were issues, delays, and being able to navigate with uh, customers and explain the situation, even though everybody knew what was going on, if your order was late, you were still upset. Uh, so having those conversations, reassurance, uh, showing that we were going above and beyond to get a better outcome, and again, really relying on those relationships and the internal expertise. Um, some of the things that we do is when people were shying away from providing accurate information to customers, uh, so INCO terms for us, most of the time is a C term, which is when we load the container, we're done, and it's your responsibility. So when people were doing that in this situation, because the carriers didn't have updated information, the truckers didn't have updated information, we actually implemented a new initiative and created a brand new department to do data validation and to basically follow that container all the way to destination, and every time there was a change, we would advise the customer. So then we actually saw that as an opportunity to differentiate ourselves and to go above and beyond in our service, which has become a calling card and a sales point. Because one of the things that I also do in my role is I travel with salespeople, whether they like me or not, I'm going with them, and then meeting customers, selling what we're doing, explaining, yes, we had a rough patch, but this is what happened. Uh, has been a very successful story for us. So it actually ended up helping us more than hurting us, even though it was really rough for some time. Yeah. Well, how, um, yeah, that's, a, that's fascinating. Um, and I wanna come back to you about the, the good stories we're talking about, that, that'll come at the end. But um, I guess, what resources would y'all say have either been more helpful, uh, most helpful to y'all, or what could you use in terms of help on, on the export side uh, in general? Dino Elias. What's that? Dino Elias. Dino Elias. Valuable resource. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's uh, well, Claudia. How did you get that visibility into into the, the supply chain, right? Like, if, if you're dropping it off with the logistics provider, how do you how do you track it at that point? So we actually manage our own logistics for right. the most part, uh, and then again, having those, we have direct contracts with the tab steamship lines, mm -hmm. so we're able to deal directly with okay. them. Uh, technology, again, we implement it. We're a high. Um, focus on technology type of companies, so then uh, working in different projects with uh, specialists in that segment of the industry, getting information, getting updates from the steamship lines, going above and beyond that. The 
with the relationships that we had in every single spot of the chain because again the issues happen not only in one portion it happens with the ports with the truckers with the carriers with the uh, storages locations uh, so it was basically enabling those relationships that we had built over all of those years to really call and say hey I need you to do this I need this help give me the information uh, also changing our mindset because we were always very much about in our industry it's about the volume we don't have the fat margins at least too high <laughs> so then it's really about the volume uh, so then sacrificing margin to get the product to where it needed to go adjusting that it's not the cheapest container is the container that is available for us to be able to move the product so sometimes you have to come to very quick decisions and change what you were doing for a very long time in order to continue your success and it's painful during that process, but that's what you need to do in order to service and maintain those accounts. It was a hard time. Yeah. Roger, do you want to add anything to that? Anything else? Just, logistical issues as well, but maybe not. Well, so you want getting, to getting things and, yeah. and uh, supply chain, you know, you order something that used to be a month and now they're telling you six months. Right, right. So you still put that into your design and mm -hmm. then six months later they say, oh yeah, it's gonna be another six. Yeah. Managing change, right. Change, right? You got a million dollar machine sitting on the floor that needs a two hundred dollar part. Yeah. That you can't get. Yeah. And uh, and you depended on that. Mm -hmm. Well, AJ, I know you you don't sound like you're hurting for inquiries <laughs> or uh, potential customers, but I was going to ask, how do you fend off you know, the challenge from other uh, lower cost countries around the world? Well, I tell you, the the, the big part is the cost of bringing parts in is okay. gone through the roof. Yeah. The uh, duties is insane. I mean, yeah. uh, I don't know, it was it Trump that did it? Yeah. I don't know what yeah. happened, man, but he just like, <laughs> the <train war>. uh, <laughs> stuff that we bring in, like we need some parts from wherever, uh, and the, the duties, China is, is, is horrendous, yeah. you know, the cost. So we got to pass that on, but uh, that's that's been the work the hardest thing is bringing you know things in and paying a ton of money for it mm. that we used to pay a lot less yeah i know that there's I'm, there are people here that know a lot more about this than i do but i know there's like foreign trade zones where you can bring stuff in add the value that you're going to add and, and export out without incurring the tariffs but maybe some somebody that's yeah if, you, if anybody knows about <laughs> what we could do to lower our costs that'd yeah. be awesome yeah Seriously. so we can have some conversations after we're done but uh, Mexico is really. But um, so I was going to ask too, like how do you um, how do you look at market strategically? Like, do, like, do, you, do you think about where's the next place we should focus, or do you go to trade shows that are particularly focused on certain parts of the world? I really centers. don't do anything. I mean, they, they just come to us. I swear, I'm not lying. It's just, we just hit the Brazilian market and it's going crazy. I don't know what's going on. Uh, offshore, they got offshore drilling rigs up there, and uh -huh. we're selling, you know, a ton of valves, thousands of them, yeah. to Exxon and Chevron uh, and uh, some of the uh, Brazilian national companies. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not really sure. I'm. I don't know where, like I said, I really don't know what, where it's coming from. Yeah, uh, it's word of mouth. It's just, yeah. you know, Great. snowballing. Yeah. Roger, are you facing a lot? I mean, it seems like we talked about the trade war, but it seems like technology, anything related to defense is becoming much more um, contentious. There's a lot more regulation around it. Are you finding that making it harder for you to sell in certain parts of the world or given your, your customer base being more I haven't. Uh, so far, we haven't really seen that that is causing. One of the things that AJ said earlier is that people like American mm -hmm. products, yep. yeah. and and for building uh, aircraft and big trucks, they like American products. Yeah. So it's so it, uh, first time I really did a lot of uh, travel across Asia. So I'm custom, you know, I go into a say a Boeing factory mm -hmm. in Lockheed or uh, Airbus even, and they know I'm coming. We're going to talk about you know doing what whatever they want, and there'll be three or four, you know, people that I meet with. <laughs> you go in a conference room in China or Malaysia or Indonesia or something like that, there's 40 people yeah. <laughs> came to talk about this mm -hmm. subject. So it just seemed like, you know, they've got, they want to do, they want to learn from us, they mm -hmm. want to do, they want to do things the way we do things. Yeah. So it's a, the, 
it, so being American does make my life easier. Yeah, in that regard. yeah it's huge. Yeah. Uh, Bobby, I know that uh, we talked about the China challenge, right, like in terms of manufactured products, but I'm sure it's still a huge market for what y'all do. Um, can you talk about how trade with China has changed in recent years? Yeah, so basically um, China is one of our biggest markets. Um, and it's a market that you have to be in because it's a market that moves markets. So then if China is buying, then other markets are gonna feel that yeah. effect, that supply is going to be out of the market, the prices are going to shift. So it's a market that you continuously have to be in. Plus the potential based on the amount of people and the buying power, which is increasing uh, with development is huge. So then what we had to be very mindful was the trade barriers, which sometimes if they're known, then you can adjust to them, you can work through them, but when they're arbitrary in some cases and saying, okay, we're not going to accept it because it is effective on that moment, you mm -hmm. have no time to prepare, you have containers on the water, so then it makes you be very strategic as to the products, the customers you're gonna be dealing with, the terms that you're going to be handling uh, in terms of payment terms, because you have to have some security, so it shifted in terms that with the pandemic and all these changes in the politics of it, we now require a 30% deposit for all of our sales in China. And then deviation from that is rare and it depends on the customer, the knowledge and the uh, opportunity, but it's a way to safeguard that if the product gets there and all of a sudden it's not allowed in, we can pivot and divert it, move it somewhere else, cover our costs so then you have to put extra mitigations. Also the, the type of products, there's some products that are more protected than others, some mm -hmm. channels that are more protected. We used to go a lot through, uh, in some cases, send product to Hong Kong, to buyers in Hong Kong that would send to China. We stopped doing that because the risk was too high, so then now it's only to mainland China. So then you have to adjust to anticipate the risks, mm -hmm. which sometimes you don't have time to prepare, but at the same time, take advantage of the opportunities because when China gets animal disease like they did a few years ago, then that opens up a huge opportunity and a huge gap for us that we have to take advantage. And sometimes the losses and the gains offset, so then, but it's, it's a very fluid uh, market. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna ask my last question and we'll open it up uh, to the audience. I'm sure others have questions as well. Story. Yeah, I was gonna say, tell us your quick story about, um, you know, uh, so, Export uh, deal gone wrong or gone no, right? No, no. So the other. I'm, I'm, I was on the computer and uh, I get this email from the FBI and they're like, oh, we want to come <laughs> see you. I'm like, Psh. I was like freaking out because yeah. we were uh, getting a lot of requests from Iran mm -hmm. uh, for our products. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how they found out, but um, so they they came to the office and I talked to them and um, and uh, I told them, I said, you know, I will, we will not sell there for sure. There's, it's never going to go there. And yeah. you know, they wanted to know every communication that came in from there. And wow. Yeah, it was huge. I mean, they sent like two or three guys, um, and it was it, it was pretty scary because I didn't know what yeah. was going on. But. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, what would you say <laughs> to people who are interested in exporting, right? Like, because I think you cannot lot, sell to your own. You cannot <laughs> sell your own. Try. If you take one thing away or from Russia. this channel tonight, don't, don't try your own. Um, I, I think North Korea. The, the big problem. A lot of people think that exporting is insurmountable, right? Like, especially if you're a smaller company. Why am I going to take resources away from what's my bread and butter that's working here in the U.S.? I can export to Alabama and they'll be fine. You know, like, why why should they take that uh, that leap? I guess if it's, you want to, I if think you it's, to be as it's, inspiring as you possibly because can. Because it, it just makes the, your company number one a global operation, not just uh, U.S. Or, or regional. Yeah, I think it's a huge prestige to be able to sell to other countries. You know, U.S. made products. So yeah, I think it's awesome. Great. Hey, y'all want to end on that? Possibly positive note. Well, <laughs> I think the United States is around five percent of the global population. Yeah. For you, it's five percent of your business, so you, you kind of match the, you kind of match that. So I'm working my way that way. <laughs> so, uh, but it, but the it, the market is bigger outside than inside. Yeah, I mean that's I mean, that's probably true, that's true for just about everything except maybe American flags. Yeah. I mean, this is your bread and butter. Y'all do this every day, but you know, a lot of companies don't have the same resources that Intera might have. But you have to start somewhere. 
how do you how do you kind of get started and and um, take advantage of the opportunities while making sure you're not overextending, I guess. Well, so for us, um, everybody has to eat. So uh, and there's people all over the place. So for us, it was important to create a diversification for risk mitigation because if you're dependent in one market and one market alone, if something happens with that market, um, obviously it's not gonna go well for you. Also, the world is becoming a more open place, whether we like it or not, depending on position on it, it's happening. And then some markets like the US tend to be mature markets for some products. So then you have to start expanding in other markets where you're going to have more opportunity for growth. And again, the uh, CEO of the company has always been a visionary that he wanted to be a citizen of the world. So for him, it was a personal mission that he wove into the company mission. Uh, so then it was part of getting out there, seeing opportunity, connecting people, meeting people, bringing people together. And obviously you have to make money in the process to keep these people uh, fed. And, and employed, but it was, I think it was a calling that a lot of us that work in the company actually are passionate about. That's why we're in the company because we feel the same way. We're passionate about people, service, relationships, uh, being together, learning about other cultures, and you have to make that commitment when you become an international company. It cannot be, I'm going to sell into another country, but I'm gonna sell the same way that I sold in the US. You have to be open to understand those nuances and those changes. Great, thank you. That was good. Good marching